I'm a security guard hired to protect an estate. The forest has eyes. Part 14. There's a weird finality to this. Not knowing what's ahead. Not knowing if anyone will ever see the words I'm typing into the now way over bloated notes doc on my phone. Not knowing if John and Isaac made it out. I guess, as cheesy as it sounds, this is where faith comes in. To me, it's not really faith in God. It's more faith in self. I'm scattered brained. I'm sorry. What I'm trying to say is this elevator has been going down for quite a while. I dropped my kit to the side of me along with my rifle and I've just been sitting my back against the wall of the elevator. I don't know how long it's been. The clock on my phone has been stuck at midnight on the dot never changing. Midnight. I've taken to consolidating what's left. After that bum rush through the woods, the house, the chop shop, I've got three magazines of 5.56, about 90 rounds. They're inside some good old ASC magazines, the metal ones you see mercenaries using in C-list action movies. A single road flare and one single incendiary grenade. I am officially up Schitt's Creek with a spork. A bit of irony I realized is that regardless of all the $16 a piece windowed mags I bought, I ended up just hammering the trigger and full auto blasting my way into the depths of the house. You can try and make what you think is the most foolproof plan, but in the end, once adrenaline kicks you in the teeth, You're going for a ride. Adrenaline. Yeah, I'm starting to feel it wear off now. Blood in my hands is starting to slow down, so they're getting a bad case of pins and needles. Exhaustion is setting in. Strangely, though, I'm getting warmer. I thought that it was all the running, but I realized that... Before, when I was running through the house above, I could see my breath in the cold air. Now, not so much. Whether this means that either this endless elevator is about to drop right into the magma layer of the earth, or if we're entering some area several thousand feet under the surface with air-conditioned heating, I don't know. She's also been here the entire time, sitting against the left side wall just out of the corner of my eye. I don't know if she'll disappear if I try and talk to her, so I've just let her be. As much as she's helped me, I still don't know where she sits in all of this. This is her house, she told me that, but what's it mean? Was she kidnapped? Is she one of these things just in disguise? Is she tricking me? I mean, no, probably not. She could have easily led me into a room full of those ghouls when we were back topside. I mean, well, semi-topside. She's led me the right way so far. So, I guess I've got to have faith in my newfound ally. Exhaustion is setting in again. I rubbed my eyes, my corneas feeling like they just went ten rounds with a golden glove. The headache stopped, but I still felt completely fried. It's a haze. An infinitely traveling industrial elevator. The groaning of gears. The cries as the probably decades-old cable struggled to lower it without dropping it and killing me. I needed to stay awake through it all. I couldn't stop yet. I wasn't done. Not yet, but almost. Then, through all the theorization, 
the thoughts of finality. Prepping my gear, I heard the winch get slower. It started to groan as the decades-old brake pads screeched in an attempt to slow the elevator so that its poor, stupid, former yet somehow just as jarhead inhabitant didn't meet an anticlimactic end via dead drop. We're here, she sung in a low melodic voice. Correction, my newfound, still just as creepy ally. I pulled my kit over my t-shirt, leaving my soft shell jacket, slipping my head through and strapping it tight around my waist. I locked my weapon's bolt to the rear, slapping one of my final three magazines in and slapping the release home. As I squared up with the mouth of the elevator, watching the rocky yet strangely metallic surface outside pass by slower and slower, I watched her come up to my left side out of the corner of my eye. And to think, not long ago, she was trying to get my redneck friend to kill me. I guess the saying is true. The enemy of my enemy will help me salt and burn them. The elevator shook as we reached our final destination. With an electronic buzz, the cage doors of the elevator were pulled open to reveal it. The yellow, dying overhead lights of the elevator did little to help illuminate the area. I was able to see about 10 meters out into the area, and I could make out a few details. Firstly, the floor was made of a dark metal square tile pattern. It seemed to stretch off well past the black void that bathed the area. Secondly, the black void itself. That's exactly what it was an impermeable, impenetrable wall of absolute black that shrouded the area as far as I could see. As far as however big this chasm stretched. And no matter how many minutes I stood there, well, remember the natural cat eye that I mentioned earlier? Yeah, well, my eyes never seemed to adjust to it. And lastly... I think it was a chasm, at least. The echo of our elevator dead stopping and shaking seemed to echo for a while. Even as I finished pondering this, I could still hear the metal shake of it continuing to bounce off however far the walls went. I'll bet you five bucks, if this isn't hell... It sure looks really similar. I was going to need some light. I tried to turn on the surefire lights that I had attached to my rifle's rail. Nothing. I guess all the getting thrown into a wall, through a wall, and off a balcony by an ogre must have shortened the warranty lifetime on it. Regardless, I still had one more source of light. I slung my rifle to my front and I reached to my back pocket and pulled out the road flare, twisting off the cap. It hissed as a burst of bright red light came from the top. Voices in the darkness hissed and roared, sounding like they were at first just at the edge of the black veil immediately starting to back up with slapping bare feet. Holding the grip on my rifle in my right hand, I held the road flare high with my left, and I proceeded forwards. The room was as I described, gigantic. Truth be told, I still don't know how high it was, I got about 20 meters into the area before I was greeted by several large cage-like walls. Locked and bolted onto the floor, they shot upwards to a ceiling that was too far for even the flare to illuminate. 
they were metal with small slits, big enough to fit some fingers or parts of a hand through. The kind of caging you'd see on cattle cars. One segment shot leftwards, another rightwards. Both met in the middle where they created about a 10 meter wide path leading forwards. I gazed at the floor. In worn yellow lettering it read, Administration. A yellow line at the mouth of the path was drawn just above it. I stepped past the line and immediately I heard the voices, not laughing or mocking this time, but roaring in anger and spite. A set of footsteps to my right came barreling towards me and I immediately pivoted. The cage wall shook as in between the narrow slits I could see a large figure, slimy, silver body, shoving its bloated hand through in a vain attempt to get to me. It didn't work. It just grabbed onto the cage and shook it, roaring into the air. My instincts caused me to pivot towards the thing aiming my rifle, yet the voice in the back of my mind reminded me that I only had 90 rounds. So I'll admit it. I stood there, flare in one hand, rifle aimed, and I laughed. Well, sucks to effing suck, a la old Sergeant Walker. This must have angered the creature because all it did was shake the cage violently. Then another one from the left side crashed into its cage wall, and it began shaking it. Then another one on the right side. The shaking of the metal was so loud, I started to become unable to hear myself think as a chorus of malicious voices and steel came raining down. Dwight. The girl's mind reached through the sea of laughs and cackles and pulled me back to the surface. I gazed down at the walkway where she stood. She turned to her right and pointed down the path into the darkness. Keep going. She was right, at least for now. They weren't going to be hurting anybody. For now. I continued down the path and more and more of them continued to jump on their cage walls. The darkness became thinner and thinner as I walked down it. And all the while, they yelled their evil threats at me. We will wear your skin. The further I went, the more I could see the end of the path. The red flickering light of the road flare revealed a set of metal double doors built into a metal wall looking just like the floor albeit looking much more aged with the reflective surface worn and aged. Do not hurt us, the voices yelled. No windows on the doors, a simple knob on each of them. The word administration written across both in faded yellow paint. Dwight. No, 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 no. I was getting really tired of them saying my name. We will make it long and agonizing. And then, when I was barely feet from the door, they stopped. I honestly paused because I believed all of the years of combat had finally caught up to me and made me go deaf. It was at this point I realized I was still wearing my Walker headphones. I pulled one muff off and gazed around. They were still there, their beady eyes staring daggers into me. But they stopped attacking the cage walls. They instead backed off slowly and quietly. I looked back at the door. Months of fighting, searching, investigating, hundreds of rounds expended, and here it was. 
administration. I placed my bets now on whether or not Isaac was right on this being an eldritch horror. I did not want to have to pay him 25 bucks if I somehow made it out of this. Keeping the flare still held tight, I broke off a few fingers to reach for the knob. Stop! Her voice echoed as she jumped in front of the door, causing me to back off a few paces as she stood there. I was more surprised by how fast she moved, or more likely appeared. Her voice was still echoing. Wait, she only talks directly to me in my head. She never says anything out loud. Do not look upon it, she said, pressing her back to the door. Now, I'm fairly confident that she's some sort of paranormal being. Whether it be a ghost, a demon, or something else. So, it made me pause for a second and realize that she was saying this with very real fear in her voice. We stared at each other. She continued to block the way defiantly as my mouth paused. Waiting for my mind to come up with a response. Why? She withdrew one of her arms to point at me. No, behind me. I slowly turned around, fully expecting this to be the moment where she double-crossed me, and a demon from the depths of whatever magma lair hell we were in would jump out and end me. Instead, I saw them again. The eyes the sea of eyes all staring through the gaps in the cage walls, white with beady pupils, the eyes that had been watching me for a while now, all the way up to this. I looked back to her and she continued to point, refusing to tell me what she was trying to say, and I looked back. The eyes continued to stare. What? I yelled, looking back at her. They're staring, so what? Again, she refused to answer me, instead pulling her arm back to block the door. I continued to stand there, dumbfounded. So what? They were staring with those beady eyes. Unnatural. Twisted, deformed, changed eyes. They stared upon it. They all did. The cogs finally started to work in my head again as I put all the pieces together. The house, the lab, the chop shop. The thing that changed them, cut them up forced them to be these disgusting, evil things and locked them down here to throw them at whoever it wanted next. They knew they weren't going to get out of that cage. They didn't want to. They were trying to scare me away. What's that saying? Gaze long enough into the abyss and the abyss will gaze back. Stare at the denseness of the forest long enough, and it will effing take you. I tossed the flare behind me, bouncing and sputtering as it hit the floor. I turned back to the door, and like always, she was gone. I gripped the doorknob, my heart rate skyrocketed as my left hand shook. Don't look upon it, I thought. So, what? Close my eyes? Sure, great idea. Charge into the belly of the beast with my eyes closed and three mags. She was probably leading me into a trap, but she did warn me. Maybe it was all BS to get me to go running at it with my eyes actually closed like a moron. Or maybe it wasn't. 
She's led me right this far. I gotta have faith in her. I guess. I slowed my breathing, shaking my head as I turned the knob and kicked open the door with my eyes closed. My hand shot to the angled grip on my rifle, clenching it through the gloves and pulling it tight into the pocket on my shoulder. It was dark. I could see the red light of the flare illuminating the back edges of my eyelids for a few seconds. Then, getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, then disappearing as I heard the double doors close behind me. It was quiet. Not silent, but quiet. With my vision now more or less gone, my other senses started to come into play. First, hearing. I could hear the ambient noises of what I think were hospital monitors. A low but steady beep of a heart monitor and others were several meters in front of me. The small echoing of it bounced off the walls, kind of giving me an idea of how big the room was. It wasn't as big as the outside, but it wasn't a closet either. Maybe 30 meters by 30 meters, give or take. Next was smell. I've had the privilege of being able to bitch about smelling a lot of shit in my life. Literal shit, metaphorical shit, ethical shit. Burning rubber, burning human waste, burning flesh... The kind of stuff to cut up the inside of your nostrils and send your mind reeling from the stench. But this was worse. Way worse. I physically cringed as I breathed a bit in. Like an ancient corpse was dug out of a mass grave, shit on, and set on fire with no kerosene. I felt like I was inhaling several tons of fiberglass, and the irony taste that followed told me that it had made my nose bleed. And yet, despite whatever my other senses told me about this place, nothing responded to my loud entrance into the room. I stood there holding my current position as I wasn't being physically attacked yet, but too afraid to move forward for fear of whatever it was that was just paces ahead of me, that it would chew me up, spit me out, and possess my corpse, like it had done to all the others. Everyone who looked at it met its eyes in the forest, in this house, in this metal tomb, Everyone it had taken from their families, killed, kidnapped, worse. Don't open your eyes, Dwight, I repeated in my head. And it just stood there, eyeing me. I could tell that it was watching me. I knew it was. It had to be. My face was twitching with anger With anticipation, I pulled the stock of my rifle so tight into my shoulder, I think I could have popped it out of its socket. This was a standstill, a standoff, both sides waiting for one to make the move. All the emotion, all the anger finally boiled over as I opened my mouth trying to get the words out. Come on out! A rushed, aggressive response, but under the circumstances, I think I could be excused for not being my usual curse word smithy self. It bounced off the walls as my mind quickly rushed to see what it could make of the echolocation. Nothing. No words, no response, no army of demons rushing out to tear me apart. Just the long, drone-out beeping. I just pointed my rifle at the darkness in front of me, unable to see if there was a smiling Cheshire creature in front of me 
or absolutely nothing. And again, I spoke. I'm right here. Nothing. As a gesture to show that I was serious, I flicked my selector switch to semi-auto. The click to me was instinctually burned into my mind to tell me it's about to go down. The small click. The mechanical safeguard taken off the weapon meant that three pounds of force was all it needed to go off. What I'm getting at is... It's the international signal for, I'm about to shoot your head off. And still, nothing. I stood there, finger hovering over the trigger well, knowing that I had 90 rounds. 90 shots to make count. No resupply. No armored car to go grab a can of loose rounds from. Nothing. Three mags, one rifle, and a historically aggressive trigger finger behind it all. I'm right here. Stop hiding. I yelled. Nothing. I'm gonna burn your haunted forest and your haunted house to ash. I screamed at it. Still nothing. Come out. I yelled. Dwight Anthony Nolan. The voice was off, like most things here. But it was a different kind of off. It sounded male and female and young and old all at the same time. Like multiple people were speaking in unison, but not as a group. Just merged together. Then it spoke again. It broke up its sentences as different voices spoke different parts. An old man would say one portion, a young female would say another, all of which sounded too calm. Angelically so. Former United States Army Staff Sergeant, born in Chicago, served ten years before calling it quits. Signed a several thousand dollar fixed rate contract to Kazimov Industries in an attempt to jumpstart his dying career as a washed up mercenary. It sounded like different opinions of me all mashed together. Some praising me, others mocking me. But everything that they said was true. How did they know my middle name? My pay rate? Awarded the Combat Infantry Badge March 2011. How the... For reacting to enemy contact on... Offered a spot in the United States Army Ranger. All right, I get it. I screamed. The sudden interruption silenced them, and we stood there. They were coming from my immediate front, maybe ten meters away, maybe twenty. With the amount of echo in the air, it was hard to tell. My eyes were closed, but I could feel whatever it was staring back. Does it bother you, Dwight, knowing you could not save them, any of them? The question was piercing, meant to rile me up, but I could feel it wasn't about the people in my unit that were killed, but the people in the forest. Fine, you want to throw shots? Two to tango then. Does it excite you every time you take one of them from their families? Every single time someone gets ripped out of their homes and turned into whatever is in that formerly human cattle pen outside, does it get you off? I was met with silence. Well, more silence. Say something. No. 
I still don't know if it was answering my question or being snide. It spoke in the voice of Merkel from the gun store in town. The forest is a dangerous place, Dwight. Then the voice of the old woman from the manor, Candace. Hundreds of thousands of people go missing every year, sweetie. Many of these are taken by the old and hungry forces that lay within. Then, in John's voice, Call me calculating. Call me... Then in Theodore's voice, Eccentric. But I knew that when my wife went missing, I needed to do something... Theodore, I yelled. Then, in the voice of one of the southern sheriffs in the town, Not quite. Your boss, Theodore, he knows exactly what to expect when he arrived here. He has known for a while. He knew about all the workers he was sending to their deaths trying to build that. Then, in Isaac's voice, Overblown log cabin right in the middle of Witch's Alley. He also knew exactly what he was doing throwing you into the woods with a... Then a Gareth's voice. Point three oh eight bolt action with that shitty four-wheeler. Then in Roseanne's voice. We feel bad for you, Dwight Hunt. We really do. However, I know you've seen the mission on that board. You know full bloody well that many more people are lost to this. Then in the voice of the mother from the bar, Danny's mother, Mrs. Hothfield. I tried to scare you off, show you what was happening here is bigger than you, but you wouldn't listen. The forest is a sea of forces. You can't stop. You can't battle. You can only hope to control. Then it went back to Theodore's voice. Theodore said that I was crazy. I told him that I could do it. But he said that I was on a fool's errand. It cost me everything. My mind, my spirit, my body, my daughter. The last comment confused me. Up until I felt the girl wrap her arm around my leg. It was all starting to make sense. Her house. This was getting long-winded. It was also getting clearer, yet confusing at the same time. Some things made sense, some things didn't. Some things still don't. A sea of forces. Yeah. There's a lot of weird things in the woods. But to do this? Do what it had done to those people in the cages back there? What did it mean by control? Just stop. Stop rambling. Stop trying to spout some exposition or spin a narrative. You lost someone. I've lost someone. Everyone has here. Yes, people go missing every day. But to do... I knife-handed back towards the doors. To do that to people. To do all of this. It's a necessity. It responded. It's inexcusable, you SOB. The voices began to change to those that I didn't know. Every other word now. Wrong place. Wrong time. Bad hand. Bad luck. To white. It's an evil that must be done. That must be kept beneath the surface. Less hungry men, like Theodore, try to uncover and use it. Well, I guess you failed, haven't you? All it took was a washed-up staff sergeant, a redneck, and a paranormalist a couple of months to figure you out. You're committed, motivated, hungry. You didn't get scared, shook. You persevered. You're different. You act like a hero. The type of man to get to the bottom of all of this. It's the same reason that you must 
realize I can't let you leave. My throat ran dry, making it hard to swallow after it said that. My hands started to sweat inside the mechanic's gloves as I continued to try to zero in with closed eyes. You said it yourself. It said as it changed into my voice. This is it. This is the end. I hope I'll be back. How did it know? Did it surf the web? Had it heard everything I said? How? No one will find you. No one will realize what's really, really out here. Theodore will never find the truth. Or else he will harness it. The cabin will be burned. Your friends will be saved. And nobody will ever find out what happened to the security guard hired to protect the estate. Then... A sound that felt a lot more nerve-wracking this time sent a chill up my spine. From beyond the double doors, the things began to attack the cage walls again. Except this time, not in a smothered, reeled-in attempt to scare me away, but in an intentional way, jumping at it pulling and shaking at it, throwing their heavy bodies against the cage walls in an attempt to break them down, to get to me. The chorus of screams and noises were muffled behind the door, but they wouldn't be for much longer. I didn't know where it was or how far it was, but I knew that it was in front of me. The echoing, the sounds, all came as directly in front of me as I could make out. A while ago, I said, while waiting for Roseanne and Isaac in that armored-up battle wagon, that I feared becoming another casualty, another name on the memorial wall, another missing sign up on that cork board, Taken, killed, gone, missing, turned inside out, cut up, thrown into the high branches of a tree, into a canyon, found in pieces, not found at all, disposed of, forgotten, erased. All of the work we had done to get here, all of the fighting to get to the bottom of this, a pointless waste as an army of demons now fought to get out of their cage to tear me limb from limb, and a horror at the center of it all that I couldn't even gaze upon. This entire thing was just a bad hand, but I've been playing it ever since the start. I wasn't gonna let the story end like this, this wasn't going to be where the road ends. 65 names alone on that missing person's board. Some dating back years. Others just days ago. Let alone the thousands that go missing every day. All because some fight, struggle, some sad little game that we're stuck in the middle of. F that. For what I hoped was the last time, I switched to auto. A burst of 5.56 shot out from my barrel. The muzzle flash could be seen even with my eyes closed, giving me some sense of positioning. The horde behind me continued to try and break through as the voices in front of me simply continued to scold me. It's... Useless. Stop fighting. I know you want to rest. I adjusted my stance, trying to make sure I wasted as little rounds as possible. I raised my weapon again. This time I held down the trigger, 
and rode the lightning. My poor 15. God knows how much carbon and gunk had built up inside of it, firing mag after mag. But it pulled through. Clink! My bolt locked to the rear after the last round. I dropped the mag, hearing the empty piece of metal bounce off the floor, and I slapped in a new one and sent the bolt home. Stop! You can't win! The voices continued to yell as defiantly as ever, but a little birdie reassured me. They're scared. Keep going. Hurry! Another burst of automatic fire as my rifle spewed 30 all-American demon-killing tungsten 5.56 rounds into whatever lay beyond. The mashing and groaning of metal from beyond the doors had increased and gotten louder as dozens, hundreds, thousands of them now tried to escape. The bolt locked back again but there was still light coming from beyond my eyelid. My muzzle wasn't firing. It was coming from beyond. Stop! Dwight! Stop! Whatever I was firing at, I was hurting it, burning whatever was around it. I hoped to whatever God existed as I slapped my last mag in and I hit the bolt release. By now, the things outside of the room had gotten louder, more violent, enraged. I could hear the cage walls groaning and bending even inside of the thick double doors. The voices cried out, You don't know what you're doing. The little girl cheered me on. We're almost there. Hurry. The last magazine. Last burst of full auto. Last try. I shouldered my rifle and held my breath. My rifle's muzzle was now smoking as I could smell the scent of gunpowder and smoke coming off my weapon. I pulled the trigger and began to dump my last 30 rounds into the demon that lay beyond my eyelids. As whatever I had done to it caused the fire in front to get louder and louder, as the breaking of glass, the crashing of equipment could be heard, clink, empty. I stood there breathing heavily as I continued to be squared up with my empty, now useless rifle. Then the voices began to laugh. I effed up. I failed. 90 rounds at 90 shots per minute to make count. Full auto into whatever was ahead of me. And I didn't have enough to put it away. One rifle. One shot at stopping this. Gone. Zip. Done. As the dread of it all set in, the voices outside grew louder as the breaking of bolts and the crashing of metal could be heard. They were nearly there. This was it. I had failed. So much preparation. So many attempts. All boiled down to nothing. No more rounds. No more guns. No more. Wait. I had one last thing, one last ace up my sleeve. I dropped my rifle hearing the six pounds of weaponry hit the floor. I slid my right hand to my back right side of my kit and I pulled out a container, a cylinder, running my hands over the orange diamond on the front of it. I knew what it was, an M14, an incendiary grenade filled with phosphorus, benzene, and a whole lot of hate. We used it to torch equipment, down vehicles, 
It's not meant to explode. Just heat up and cause enough fire to burn through anything. Even being able to burn underwater. It was my last shot. I don't know what lay ahead. But from the burning I saw underneath my lids, I knew this would do something. Put it away, even if it meant that the ghouls behind me would lay waste to me afterwards. John would be safe. Isaac would keep him safe. Roseanne would tell the world of the truth. The sounds of the cage walls, segments falling to the floor, followed by the maniac screams of it, awoke me from my pondering. With one last determined exhale, I gripped the spoon tight and pulled the pin. Dwight, stop. I don't know how high the room was, but I could tell from it hitting whatever ceiling was above that I had thrown it far enough. Hopefully, the sound of the cylinder bouncing off the metal roof, then the floor, then the floor again, until the hissing, the phosphorus, Whether white or red, I didn't check. I didn't care. Both would work. I could see the flare from the top of the grenade. It made contact with whatever lay beyond, and I heard their screams. Young, old, adult, child, male, female, it cycled through all of the people it had taken. Some that I knew. Many I didn't growing louder than the screams behind me as they began to pound on the door. The fire ahead of me grew larger and larger. The orange hue beyond my eyelids flashed purple, then orange, then green. You left everything up. Phil, you killed them all. The voices began to melt into a sea of screams as the sounds of the crackling got louder. The footsteps behind me grew louder, and for a moment, the sound seemed to pause. Before an explosion, a climax, the pressure of the moment implodes and builds up. Oxygen is sucked in, and for a moment... There's a pause. Right before the grenade goes off, the trigger is pulled before a shot. Before the fighting really truly begins or ends, there's a moment of clarity. It reached out to me, trying in one last vain attempt in the voice of Sergeant Clancy. Dwight! In that moment... At the time, it seemed like forever. Letting myself be taken, preparing for the end. Looking into the void that had taken control of my life for so many months, caused so much death, so much pain. I answered back to its pleas with one single phrase. Gotcha. And then I was blown back. Whatever all the equipment I had heard from the beeping had erupted. Whether or not it was the smell of the air mixing with the phosphorus. I, a 200 pound man, felt myself thrown back by the sheer force of it all. On a convoy through the box, one of our Vicks was hit. And the gunner was thrown out after his harness had been broken. He survived a bit banged up. But he described the descent as a roller coaster without the safety. My back slammed into the double doors. My back plate slammed into me. And the bolt and knobs were probably blasted off as I found myself flying backwards. I landed square on my shoulders, flipping over and rolling. I don't know, it could have been a few feet, it could have been a mile. My eyes remained shut, whether or not I wanted them open. And then, silence. No beeping, no laughing, no voices. 
no giggling, no haunted reminders of my past, no demonic shape-shifting vocal cords from the darkness beyond, just silence. My body ached as consciousness returned to me. I cringed. The headache from earlier returned. This time it had gotten promoted to a migraine. My back screamed, my legs felt heavy, and it took all of the force I had to try and push myself to my feet. But my body gave out. I collapsed right back down onto my face. I got a healthy serving of whatever disease-infected stuff was on the floor, too. There was a small orange hue beyond my closed eyes at the edges, and I could hear the growing sound of crackling flames. The smell had gone. The things had gone. It was just me, lying face down, front plate now digging into my rib cage and throat, blowing out spit and blood from my mouth as I laid face down. Thank you. There she was. Whether a figment of my own concussed imagination, or here in the ethereal flesh, I wasn't alone. Not yet. They're gone. My house is empty. Thank you. Her slow, melodic voice helped to ease the battle of adrenaline and pain, currently slugging it out in a painful bare-knuckle match inside my body. Using my right hand, I forced myself to flip over, coughing up various substances as I breathed easier with my lungs no longer being crushed. My eyes were still closed. My hand rubbed the crusted blood and spittle off them, as I remained hesitant to open them. Was this a trick? Had it survived and used her voice to lure me? Had I really won? You can rest now. It's okay. I gritted my teeth as I attempted to sit up. Instead, my abs just screamed out in pain as I fought to get up. I had to get up. I had to get out. I had to. Ah, screw it. The clang of my back plate hitting the floor with all of me behind it echoed throughout the area. I lifted my head up slightly to spit a hard luge, clearing my mouth. As I finally laid right back down, my right hand now holding my chest as I stayed there. All of the fighting. All of the pain. All of the runs to town. All of the gunshots. All of the scares. The sightings in the woods. Hours of lost. Red Bulls. Weeks spent on investigation. All done. Gone. Finished. All of the fighting to stay awake ended as it was done. 34 years of age was finally catching up to me. Exhaustion. Weariness. My mind panicked at first. Was this it? Was I going to die? Go into a coma and then die. What was going to happen? I couldn't move. I couldn't get up. I... I finally just let myself go. I guess I could rest now. Isaac was safe. John was safe. All of them. And then, as the crackling of the fire began to sound out in the distance... I let the darkness take me.